Thank you. Um, thank you all for coming. I think that you'll see that this is a picture of the Lockwood Farm and a lovely picture of a hemp bud. And over in the top right corner, a picture of the front of the Johnson Building, which as most of you know, is where we in analytical chemistry all work. Uh, I thought that I would start out with a brief history of the station. This would be the briefest of histories. We are the oldest agricultural experiment station in the, st in the United States. We were actually established prior to the land grant university, which gives us a unique uh, status across the country. Um, and we were established by Samuel W. Johnson, which as you saw was the name of the building that we all work in. He was an agricultural chemist at Yale College. Um, and he was certainly a chemist. He was well known for actually uh, publishing some books. They were called How Crops Grow and How Crops Feed. And he was very concerned with plant nutrition and how improving plant nutrition can actually increase farmers yield. And what he was really well known for was actually translating his scientific knowledge to the farming community, which is where we got that original slogan, which is putting science to work for society. Between 1875 and 2022, we had a lot of other notable achievements and <laughs> many of you have already heard about those. Um, so then we'll move on to today where the Ag Station is actually governed by state statutes. And if you look these up, Title 22, Chapter 426 in the state statutes, and it covers a whole slew of things that the analytical, um, that the Ag Station has been doing for over a hundred years now. Many of those things are actually specifically listed in the state statutes and those things might include things like testing of mosquitoes, bed bugs, uh, tobacco, the nursery stock inspections that uh, Plant Path does, state entomologist duties uh, from entomology. So these, this regulatory work that we do across the station is actually um, described in quite a bit of detail in those state statutes. So moving forward, part of the state statute says that within available resources that we shall conduct analyses as required by any state agency, including but not limited to the Department of Administrative Services, Agriculture, Consumer Protection, and Energy and Environmental Protection. And ever since I started here at the station in 1990, this is the type of work that I've been doing. We do pesticide analysis, we do uh, heavy metal testing, we do feeds and fertilizers for the Department of Agriculture. And this work is really foundational to the Ag Station and certainly continues to this day. In 2011, there was a funding opportunity and anybody that knows Jason knows that when there's a funding opportunity, <laughs> we go for it. And so at that point we were becoming accredited. And this came out of the FDA wanting laboratories across the nation to actually have defensible test results and a, and a database that would be accessible to people, um, to the public that all had good data in it and not just data. So we began working towards accreditation in 2011. And in 2016, we became accredited to the ISO 17025 standard, which is requirements for um, testing and calibration laboratories. In 2016, we had pesticides, aflatoxins, and arsenic in food under our scope of accreditation, as well as pesticides in animal feed. And in 2021, we brought THC and CBD testing under our scope of accreditation. So bringing us forward to 2019, why is CAES involved in hemp? Well, a little bit of a history of the legal status of cannabis. It started with um, the Marijuana Tax Act of 1938. That was the first regulatory act that tried to control the growing of cannabis. Basically, um, they, they made it exceptionally cost prohibitive to grow cannabis by adding a tax to it. There was some feeling, how did that happen? I wasn't touching anything. Okay, so there was some feeling um, that this tax was actually imposed because even back then there was a lot of lobbyists, right? 
And the paper lobby was uh, run, was very powerful. And the paper lobby didn't want hemp to be produced for a paper pulp. They wanted wood pulp. So there was some, some indications that that's one of the reasons why they imposed this hefty tax on growing of hemp. Back then, hemp was primarily grown for fiber. Um, but the real nail in the coffin was in 1970 when we had the Controlled Substance Act. And at that point, the actual plant cannabis sativa was put on the controlled substance list, which made it actually illegal to grow that crop, not just cross prohibitive. And I suspect that between 1938 and 1970, a lot of the reason why the growing of cannabis for marijuana purposes was underground was simply because of the cost of those taxes. Moving forward in, 19, in 2014, we had the Agricultural Improvements Act, which is commonly known as the Farm Bill. And in 2014, they created a pilot program where states could actually um, institute a research program and begin the growing of hemp, which is low THC cannabis. This bill was widely um, believed to have been implemented because uh, cannabis can be a really good alternative to growing tobacco. A lot of the same infrastructure is used, particularly the drying. So if you were growing tobacco and tobacco use is declining, as we know nationwide, you needed to have a suitable alternative. And in one of those states that there was um, a declining growth of tobacco was certainly Kentucky. And as we know, uh, the Senator from Kentucky has a lot of power full pull in Washington. Um, and so they included this hemp and in this 2014 bill. After four years of doing it under pilot research programs, they basically legalized the nationwide growing of cannabis sativa as long as it had less than 0.3% THC in 2018 as part of that farm bill. Marijuana still remains on the controlled substance list. So any finding of a cannabis sativa plant that has greater than 0.3% THC will, um, will, is, is then considered a controlled substance. Most of the cannabis grown in Connecticut is for CBD. There is some opportunity to grow cannabis for fiber, but because the infrastructure to develop that fiber into cloth is actually not really available widely in the US, that's not really a cost effective um, means of generating fiber for most people. So we are left with most growers using CBD. And if anybody has looked at CBD products recently, you'll see that these products are very expensive. Um, so they offer an opportunity, a big opportunity for many growers to get back into a market um, and, and develop a high value product. In Connecticut, most there, there was a, a certainly a lot of uh, tobacco infrastructure in Connecticut, especially in the central, the river valley. So there's tobacco drying barns and things like that. And a number of our hemp growers are in that area, like Suffield, the sort of northwestern, north central part of Connecticut. But the reason that we got involved in this in the first place was because the Department of Agriculture contacted us and they asked us whether or not we would be willing as an analytical services laboratory to be able to test this cannabis and make sure that it meets that legal requirement of 0.3% THC. So our original um, develop, method development was centered actually on trying to see whether or not um, we could provide this service to the Department of Ag. A little bit about the biology of cannabis sativa, and, and I won't pretend to be an expert, and I know that there's probably well more experts out there in the audience, but I'll just go over this quickly for people that aren't aware. It's annual in dioecious, so that you plant it every single year from seed normally. Dioecious meaning that there's male and female plants. I, we just wanted to see whether or not we could grow it, and we threw some, some seeds in the lab and uh, I managed to actually grow, how does that happen? I'm not touching anything. <laughs> okay, so I managed to actually grow actually a male and a female plant. And you can see that the male plant is actually much, much taller than the female plant. And if you zoom in on those buds, that the male buds are droopy and they release the pollen and that the female plant bud is um, straight up. 
And sometimes it can be important to identify the difference between the male and female buds early um, in the growing cycle. Uh, the, plant, the picture down at the bottom is just a field picture. So you can see what a fully developed bud might look like where the, the, the flower fills in. So our first attempt at growing in 2019, we had a lot of problems with um, not properly getting rid of male flower. I don't understand. I'm not touching anything. It's auto. How do I do that? How do I stop it? Oh, never mind. Okay. <laughs> All right. So you want to definitely um, get rid of the pollen because the seed and the in the flower will actually interfere with the quality of that crop because the seed takes up a lot of the bulk of the material. So most of the cultivation of cannabis, you would want to eliminate the male flowers from the from the from the field. Um, in the first year, I wasn't really sure just how early or how quickly you had to go out there. And in 2019, there was really only available like a general seed, so you couldn't get um, specialty seed. So uh, I clearly wasn't out in the farm enough, and there was bees everywhere. And the bees actually really loved this. And um, I think that there was some attraction from the zinnias. My apologies to Kim because the zinnias were next to the hemp and the, the, the bees are all over the hemp. And I don't know if you're, the people counting in the field were probably like, um, <laughs> like saying, well, the bees aren't here, they're over there, right? And they were everywhere and you could literally hear them uh, buzzing like when you got there. And I was like, oh, I guess I didn't get out here early enough. So 2019 uh, was a learning experience in a lot of ways. In 2019, because the farm bill had just passed and everybody decided to grow CBD, it was very hard to actually find seed that was feminized. Um, but now it's, it's becoming easier as the seed producers are catching up with the demand for this seed. So basically what growers do, because, because culling those male plants out actually removes a lot of your biomass, and if you miss one, you can end up with a bunch of seeds. So it's bad in a lot of different ways. Um, shoot. Okay, so, um, so what they do is they can actually uh, masculinize female plants to produce pollen, and then that pollen has only female genes, and then you get seeds that have only female genes, so that you can buy now feminized seeds so that you don't have to worry as much about getting out there every couple of days and culling out those male plants. And also now you can plant a whole field and you can get back a whole field and get instead of getting back only half of a field, essentially. So as, as we move forward, pre presumably the price of those seeds will come down and they'll be more available. So that's a good thing for growers. A little bit more about the biology, the primary plant component in the plant is called um, THCA, which is a carboxylic acid of THC. And as you can see in the blue circle over there, it basically just has that CO2H group on it. Um, that that uh, THCA is not uh, psychoactive. The THC is the psychoactive component. But in the plant, it always is that in, um, it's always formed as the T the acid, and as the same for the CBDA, that is the primary plant component. And we did a little bit of work with method development, and the graph here shows that when you freeze dry it at minus fifty five. Um, when you dry that plant material, it'll still be primarily THCA, which is that far right bar graph there. So the THCA is the blue, and then the THC is the green. And if you look at the, the two bars on the left, you can see that at 100 degrees, if I dry it, I'm starting to convert that THCA to THC. So, um, so the, the process that you use for drying it will begin that conversion process. It will also just happen over time which means that if you store a dried plant material, cannabis, even marijuana or hemp, there will be some conversion of that THCA to THC. The molecular formula for THCA is that 358.48. 
And for THC, it's 314.45. And if you look at the factor down there, it's 0.877, which means if I'm going to convert the amount of THCA to THC, which would be that psychoactive component, I just multiply the THCA by that 0.877 number. And then I can add that to the amount of THC in a sample and I can get a total Delta 9 THC, which is the common terminology used in the, in the farm bill. So here are the uh, farm bill actually de definitions according as to what actually makes the plant hemp. It's any part of the plant, the seeds they're in, um, and it's that total Delta 9 THC of 0.3%. And it has to be on a dry weight basis according to um, the definitions. It also specified that it had to be a post decarboxylation product. They definitely wanted that THCA to be considered as part of the THC because obviously that's the psychoactive component. And what they're trying to do is prevent psychoactive plant material from getting out into the market. Based on these, um, this information, I reached out to some of our partner labs. And in particular, I reached out to somebody I know in Colorado who had been doing uh, this work for a number of years. And he told us that one of the easiest ways to do this was gonna be with gas chromatography using flame ionization detection. Um, and he said that if we can get away with it, you know, and he said, um, you can go ahead and he sent us some methods and then we started building off of those methods to develop our in-house testing procedure. So the primary consideration for the testing in the beginning was that we needed a really quick turnaround time. When they originally passed the preliminary guidance, they wanted 15 days from the collection of the pre-harvest test sample to the completion of the harvest. And that's a really quick turnaround time for a grower and for laboratories. And what they found through that pilot program was that most labs were taking 10 to 12 days to give results back to the growers, which didn't leave the growers much opportunity to go and harvest their crop. So what they did was um, they extended the time to 30 days in the final guidance that was put out by USDA in January of 2020. Um, CBD testing is not needed for the compliance. However, we did the CBD testing because that's obviously the things that the growers are most interested in. They wanted to know whether or not they had a quality product and how much CBD would be in that product. So we started doing the CBD testing along with the total Delta 9 testing um, just to help the growers out basically. In the USDA guidance, it clearly said that the decision on whether or not it passes or fails includes the me measurement uncertainty, which means it's not just necessarily whether it exceeds that 0.3 level, but it's whether or not the laboratory's measurement uncertainty plus or minus the test result includes 0.3. So sometimes we put out a test result that says 0.4 or 0.5, but we still say that it meets that requirement. Whenever you're talking about ISO, you have to discuss measurement traceability. And there's always this concern, right? Am I getting the same test result over time? And do I get the same test result as other laboratories? Which are essentially different questions, but both very important whenever you're talking about um, crop embargoes and, and you know, destroying, destroying a farmer's product. The dry weight basis has really been a thorn in a lot of people's sides. One of the problems with it is that in the USDA guidance, they talk about dry weight in many different ways. And I put together four different things that the USDA guidance has said, all of which are muddying the waters. Because in one case, it says you have to remove all water and another, the majority of water, one place it says dry until brittle. And another place it says dry until a consistent test weight, somewhere between usually five and 12% moisture. And all of those things aren't necessarily consistent with each other. Um, the five to 12% content, the only way to really measure 
moisture is to actually measure it. Most laboratories do something they call a loss on drying, but the loss on drying is always going to be dependent on the time and the temperature that you dry something. And if you dry to what they call a consistent weight, what people do is they put it in the oven and then they take it out of the oven, they let it cool, and then they dry, they test it. And then they put it back in the oven and then they take it out of the oven, let it cool and test it again. And they say, if the difference between those two weights is less than some percentage that it's considered dry. But that temperature that you're drying it at is, is going to affect that characteristic. And the time that you take to do that, putting it in and out of the oven is also a lot of time consuming effort to try to see whether or not it's dry. So we decided to go with the simplest thing, which is say dry until brittle. Now, to be fair, I always weigh it before and after drying. So I know exactly what the difference is. And normally it's about 20% dry material left over. Because we're drying it at 90 degrees, we actually could be losing other plant components because everybody knows that cannabis has a lot of volatile plant components. So clearly you must be losing more things than just moisture, but it, this is really the best that we can do. And it, and it offered us an opportunity to process samples relatively quickly. Because the USDA guidance doesn't say it has to be five to 12% moisture, you really, even if you tested the actual water content, you really don't get any closer to answering the question of whether or not it's dry according to the definition. Okay, so overview, we dry samples overnight in an oven at 90 degrees. We weigh out 2 gram, 0.2 grams of sample, extract it with 25 grams of methanol, and we use a gas chromatograph with a flame ionization detector. We get runs done in 10 minutes. This allows us to really quickly log out sample test results. In fact, samples can come in one day at like, say, 4 o'clock. We weigh them, throw them in the oven. We can get the results out the next day, usually by 4 o'clock or so. Um, and so this has been a great benefit, we're hoping, to the growers who have time constraints on harvesting their products. Okay, so measurement uncertainty, we mentioned that a little bit. It's included in that calculation of whether or not something sample, uh, sample passes or fails based on that 0.3% testing level. There's two terms here that are important, accuracy and precision, right? So precision, I can run samples over and over again in the lab and I can tell that I'm getting the same number, but the, the question is always, am I getting the correct number, right? That would be the accuracy, right? Am I getting the number that other labs would get if they also ran that sample? So the easiest way for us to know that we are getting the correct result is that we can run something called a certified reference material. This is a sample of dried hemp bud that we purchase with a certificate of analysis that tells us how much THC and CBD should be in that product. So then I can run that sample with all of my batches and I can tell that I'm getting not only the same number but the correct number. We also run blanks. We run every sample in duplicate. Um, this is just an extra measure of security. Again, I don't wanna fail somebody and cause them a monetary loss without being sure that we are uh, correct in our test result. We also do annual proficiency testing where a sample is mailed to us, um, usually in September and October. And then we verify that we can get the correct number on that proficiency test. So we, so we have multiple layers of guaranteeing that we can get the correct result. This is a graph of the, uh, the certified reference material. And basically that's almost a year's worth of data. And I can show that from that time frame that I always meet my acceptability criteria, which is plus or minus that 20%. For the THC certified value, I am a little bit high on a continual basis. I have a 114% of true over that year. That is more like a bias. It's not an error. And it does, um, it does make you have to make sure that you still don't overestimate the THC content and then fail somebody who should not fail. Okay, so sample guidelines for hemp published in January 15th, 2020. Uh, we went over 30 days of collection. 
the, the guidelines say interesting things like sample must represent a homogeneous composition of the lot, but it doesn't really tell you how to meet that criteria. It just says here, go out and collect samples and collect a homogeneous composition, right? It also says the sampling quote protocol must ensure at a confidence level of 95% that the cannabis plants will not test above 0.3. And I don't have much idea of how they expect the field sampling agent to go out and meet that criteria, but they put it in the document. It does say sampling must be done when flowers are present because they don't want you to go out and sample leaf material and then say it passes knowing full well that all of the CBD and the THC is held in the bud material. So some of the, the research that we wanted to focus on was trying to look at how the field sampling is going to affect those final test results that we get. And one of the questions is how does THC change over time? Originally we had a 15 day window, but now we have a 30 day window. So what happens to the THC concentration from that pre-harvest test sample until the crop is um, finally supposed to be harvested is a, is a good question, right? Um, and also how much variability is there between those plants that are in the field? Interestingly enough, that sample guidance also said that if you have a, a lot less than one acre, that you could actually represent that lot by one plant. Okay, so a little bit of background on cannabinoid synthesis, biosynthesis, right? This is all generated by the genetics of the plant. CBG is the precursor model molecule for THCA, CBDA, and CBCA. And you need a gene essentially to turn on the conversion of CBG to THCA and CBDA and CBCA. So mostly there's what we call these chemotypes. A chemotype one would be a typical hemp variety with an approximate ratio of 20 parts CBD to one part THC. Chemotype two has about a two to one ratio. And then a typical marijuana plant would be about a 40 to one ratio. So 40 parts THC to one part CBD. And it does lead you to believe in some way that it's easier for the plant or it's easier to turn on those THCA genes than it is to turn on the CBDA genes. So in all probability, um, like marijuana has a higher concentration of THCA than hemp has a concentration of CBDA. Okay, um, because there's a lot of variability in the genetics of hemp or cannabis in general, I mean, it's something that's been bred for hundreds of years, but in an underground sort of like, you know, nefarious manner. So the genetics of these plants are, are vast and not well established, but medical marijuana actually has very strict requirements on the labeling. So it has to be like exactly 28% THCA. They use what they call mother plants a lot to, to get those more consistent concentrations. So they basically grow cannabis um, without it flowering and then they, they cut it all off, they clone it, and then they put it into a flowering state by changing the day length. And it's part of the reason why the medical marijuana is all done indoors because then they can precisely control the flowering uh, by controlling the day length. Hemp varieties are relatively new um, and they are still sort of the wild west of cannabis breeding. So bringing us to the farm plot in 2020, we grew eight rows, um, eight varieties of cannabis and they're listed there. We, uh, Rich Kindly and his crew kindly put the seed, uh, planted seed in the greenhouse and then uh, put the seedlings, planted the seedlings out, laid down all the plastic and I came in and, um, you know, took the pictures. <laughs> um, so here it is, June 25th, 2020, June, July 24th, 2020. And you can see that it, it's pretty quick growing, you know. Here's August 26th, 2020, September 9th, 2020. And you can see by September 9th, we're starting to have some yellowing. Um, whoosh, we're starting to have some yellowing. And so it's starting to, uh, you know, senesce or, or, you know, slow down. Um, so some of the issues that we had in 2020, 
were that uh, the storm Isaias came through on August 6th. And there was one variety, and, and I tried to point it out here, right? It was like tall and skinny. Um, and that's where the arrow is pointing versus the other one, which is like more branched. And that entire row, because it was really tall and skinny, almost the entire row just got wiped out by that storm. That was a big storm, to be fair. <laughs> Um, also, when I came in, I noticed that the, the, there was browning on the edges of these leaves over here. And Rich pointed out that it's because of the way the wind comes down the farm and it comes off of that hill and, it, and you could see that all the damage was on the side where the predominant wind comes. So that was mostly wind damage, we assume. There was also some insect damage. Um, September 9th, 2020, I went out and saw brown, brown buds like everywhere. And this was corn earworm. And I think that there's, it might have, it blows in on the wind as well. I'm not exactly sure. I'm sure some of you know better than I do. But I, it seemed like overnight, like I go, I was out there every week and I was there and I didn't really notice it. Now, to be fair, I probably wasn't looking closely enough. But I went out and I was like, holy smokes, like there's caterpillars in there everywhere. And all of the buds that were the most mature were actually the ones that were being completely decimated by this corn earworm. And they were like just brown. There was also some damage from corn borer, although that was a lot less significant. But there was a number of plants that had fallen over and you could see that the inside of them was sort of like wiped out. Uh, my summary of growing experience was definitely make sure that people who know how to grow stuff do this for you. That's not me. Uh, removing male plants was way too much work. So the, femi the availability of feminized seed is a big benefit to growers. There is a lot of difference in the way or the timing of the bloom between the varieties, but also even within the varieties, you can look at plants that are way more mature or less mature within that row. It's, it's really obvious just even from looking at it. There was pretty extensive damage for something that people say is really easy to grow. There was a lot of insect disease. There was um, some root rots and things like that going on. And one of the things that everybody notices is the odor. It's, it's not like you can grow cannabis without your neighbors knowing that you're growing it. Literally, it smells like everywhere. And it smells in particular right when it's getting to be very, very ripe. So right when it's ready to harvest, you know, suddenly this odor fills the air, uh, probably no doubt drawing the attention of people. Okay, so we went out um, in 2020. And again, I did this in 2021, but this is going to be the 2020 data. We did weekly testing of all eight varieties. And what I did was I just snipped all the plants in the row that were that variety, a little bit off of each plant. And we did this every week. Uh, my camarada helped me a lot with all of that. Uh, and, and as we noted, there was differences in the levels of maturity. So actually a couple of pairs of plants growing right next to each other, same variety. And we looked at how they mature differently through the growing season. And we tested all plants on a single day for three of the varieties. So here's, there was eight of these graphs, but I'll just show you one of them. Uh, on the left side is the CBD concentration, and for the most part, that goes from zero to 20. I'm not sure if you can, oh, you can read it. Uh, on the right side is the THC concentration, and that goes from zero to 1%. And I think you can pretty quickly see that it's very easy to exceed the 0.3% uh, THC concentration in real terms, which, um, and the THC is the dark line, right? So you can see that it that very quickly gets up to 0.3%. And most interestingly, from about September 9th to what, September 23rd, which is maybe a two week time frame, you have a serious escalation of both THC and CBD concentrations, which means that, you know, that 30 day time frame could be potentially problematic for a lot of different reasons. So we also looked at the ratio of CBD to THC. Now, the, the bars represent the average ratio um, of CBD to THC 
that because we did this weekly, right? So within that variety, the bars represent the average ratio and the error bars represent the standard error of that ratio. And the line across the top is actually what the certificate of analysis said for the seeds that we purchased. And I think that no one would be surprised to see that the certificates of analysis overestimate the ratio of CBD to THC because they're trying to put forward that you can get really more CBD out of these, out of these plants than you probably really can. So we also tested every single plant of the Young Sim 10 on September 23rd. This plant, because these were non-feminized, that's all we had left was the 15 plants. But I think that you can pretty quickly see that there's vast differences in both THC and CBD concentration for these plants. So the blue is the CBD and the orange is the THC. And what's, what's happened here is that we have four plants in that out of the 15 that actually had a chemo type two where the CBD to THC is more like two to one than a typical hemp plant. In all probability, this is just a, a poor variety. And in fact, most, most growers did not use the Young Sim 10, although it was commonly planted in 2020. By 2021, a lot of people have moved away from it and it's primarily for this reason, because there was too much variability, not only in the production of it, but that there was these um, chemo type two plants, which are actually pretty devastating. And I think if you look at the average THC of 0.962% with a relative standard deviation of 205%, you can see that 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 amount of variability is going to be seriously problematic because you have a high probability of exceeding that THC threshold. Even though most of the plants would be below the threshold, those few plants that are above the, the threshold are way, way above the threshold and they're seriously going to affect your test results. Also, the probably the inclusion of plants like number 11, which have uh, an exceptionally low yield of CBD. We did the same thing for the spec seven. We had some suspicion because we had grown the Unsim 10 in 2019 that it was unique. So I wasn't entirely surprised by that. The spec seven was a new variety in 2020. And you can see that it is much better than the Young Sim 10, but you still have one plant in that group with uh, like 8% THC, which is definitely a psychoactive level of THC. So the RSD on that one was 157%. And to be fair, if you removed that one plant, then the RSD would be more like 15%. But that 8% THC level in that one plant, if you include that in your test sample, that's a pretty dramatic increase in the overall concentration of THC. This was the only one that didn't have any of those hot plants in the field. This was the cherry abacus 2.0. We collected every plant on October 22nd. Um, so the good news was that they're all chemo type one. And this is where you can really see in a, in a more well-developed hemp variety, but there's still quite a lot of variability. And you can see that it probably goes like CBD min of 14% to 22%, there's still quite a lot of variability in the, in the potential CBD. And also that the average THC was still 0.7%, which would still fail the, the legally allowable testing limit by a fair margin. So this is just a picture. Um, you can see the plant on the right there. You can see same variety, same day. And the plant on the right clearly has um, buds that are visible. And then the plant on the left has no buds, right? Same day, same variety. And in fact, the THC CBD concentration is about twice in the so-called more mature plant. This pair of plants we tracked over um, from August 12th till August 16th. 
at that point, this variety was one of the ones that fell over. So a lot of it uh, got lost. But I think that um, you can see the CBD on the left, the THC on the right, and the uh, less mature is the darker green and the more mature is the lighter green color. And you can see if you overlay that, that the CBD and the THC track exactly over each other, different orders of magnitude, but they track exactly the same, but that the maturity is a little bit different. One of them maintained a level for like four weeks and then escalated. And the other one was a little bit um, slower in its escalation. And that interestingly or not, the one that was less mature on August 12th actually had a higher final amount of CBD um, in the end. The ratio of CBD to THC in both plants was actually identical. So that's that, that lower graph. The maximum amount of CBD in a THC compliant plant for this um, would be about 11%. Okay, so back to some rules about that 0.3%. They did require that the measurement uncertainty be applied to that test result. Laboratories commonly determine the measurement uncertainty during a method validation. Basically what we do is we go, we take samples at different levels of the analyte that we're interested in. We run them multiple times and we run them um, with multiple analysts. Uh, we run them in multiple batches, and then we do the variability about all those numbers, and we get these standard deviations. And then because we want to do the, the coverage factor of two, basically your 95% confidence interval, we take that number, we multiply it by two, and we get a measurement uncertainty. That measurement uncertainty really is only applicable to the laboratory's activities. It doesn't really apply to what happened out in the field when somebody collected that sample in the first place. Okay, but when I produce a test result, I say pass, and at the bottom of the test result, we have a little wording that says, this result only pertains to the sample that was delivered to the laboratory. But then that test result that we produce is given to a grower who then uses that to transport his hemp commodity to whoever wants to purchase it. And that test report is guaranteeing that that lot is less than 0.3, even though we have a note saying it only applies to the sample that we received. So there's a little bit of a disconnect here with how the field sampling affects those compliance and regulatory levels. For this reason, and because the plant heterogeneity and the field sampling affect those test results, we have used a broader um, measurement uncertainty than some labs. And in fact, we've been using the 50% measurement uncertainty for quite a while now. And primarily that's because we know that the test result that we produce is affected by more than just the activities that we do in the laboratory. And on a broader level, when you look at proficiency testing data and you get this data back, laboratories that are within about 30% of the, the number, the certified value for that proficiency test will be considered passing more or less, right? So it's, it's really hard for me to believe that a laboratory, um, it, you know, their interlaboratory procedures could be less than 30%, but because we would like to apply that test result to um, whether or not you could submit it to a different laboratory and get the same result, that 30% might be a minimum that most labs should be using to apply to their test results for compliance purposes. So what are the implications for regulatory testing? Well, we have found that the GC with the FID is actually a really good procedure. We can, we can crank out test results pretty rapidly. Um, I would suggest sample size should be larger than the one plant allowed by the USDA guidance. Uh, selection of mature flowers. If I'm a sampling agent and I go out and I sample immature flowers from that field, I can definitely skew my final test result. There's no doubt about it. If I select mature flowers, then I can also skew my test result. And I'm not really clear whether or not the sampling agent should select a mixture of mature or immature plants, or whether or not they should be selecting the mature plants 
uh, so that they better represent the potential of the test rather, or the potential of that crop, or whether they should be only selecting like a mixture or, or whatever, I don't know. But this is a conversation that we need to have with our regulatory body, because they're the ones that are going to embargo these crops and impose these financial burdens on the growers. Differences in the timing of collection will certainly affect a test result. If somebody says to me, well, I'm gonna collect it and then a week later, I'm gonna go out and collect it again and I expect you to get the same number, that's clearly not gonna happen because the THC and CBD are increasing through time. Um, and differences in the drying procedure may also result in differences in uh, the test result for different laboratories. If somebody else is doing something different as far as the drying, they may not get the same number that we get for drying with our drying procedure. What are the implications for growers? I think that one of the big things was hemp varieties are very nascent. Um, there was a lot of exceeding of that 0.3% THC limit. We're hoping that as this becomes a more well-developed industry, that the seed will be more true breeding and it will have less potential to exceed that regulatory level. There is a wide variety and difference in appearance um, and not being the expert, I'll throw it to Jim Lamondia who looked at it and said, nobody would call this a variety because it looks so different in the field. If a pre-harvest test sample is taken too early, and this is a good take home message for producers, a post-harvest sample may be significantly higher in THC content. This could come up because if you sell to a producer, that producer may say, well, I need to test it on the front end because I'm going to formulate product and I don't want my final product to fail. And if there's a significant amount of time, and by significant, I mean only maybe a week or two, between the collection of that pre-harvest test sample and the, and the harvest, that final product could fail at the point of sale, especially if a producer is testing the incoming ingredients. Just something to be aware of. If the product is never tested again, it could exceed that THC level, but nobody will know because um, they haven't tested it. However, one caution, because there are, we did find some hot plants out there there are a number of growers that are selling smokable flour in Connecticut. It's an easy way to sell their product and there is some market for that. And one of the issues is that some of these plants have that potential, even if they're passing their pre-harvest test sample um, THC level. And the maximum amount of CBD and THC compliant hemp is between 10 and 15%. And this is despite what any certificate of analysis may say as far as that potential yield. Okie dokie. Thank you, uh, first of all, to Jason, who I think might be on Zoom, but thank you to Jason for allowing me the opportunity to go out into the field and do this work. And then for Chris for continuing to allow me to go out into the field and do this work. For Rich and obviously the farm crew, Raleigh, uh, for uh, doing all of the growing and the hard work out there that I'm not that good at. And Mike for helping me with sample collection and Kitty always helping me with the testing, particularly in the laboratory and making sure that when the regulatory samples were coming in that she could process those while I was out, you know, doing other stuff. And obviously the entire staff of analytical chemistry in the Johnson building, the founding uh, part portion of the station by an agricultural chemist. Thank you all for coming. I, I would suspect that growing any kind of cannabis for fiber is going to really not be uh, cost effective because there's really no mechanism for converting that fiber into any kind of product at this point. So fiber is probably out of the question at this point. I mean, for whatever reasons. Actually, as far as I got, 
Huh? That's you can't export the fiber, but I think with flax, we found that that's not really cost effective. I mean, there was a lot of, you know, consternation over flax, right? But in the end, there wasn't really much that people could do with it. So, so yeah, but that's that's one part of the question. The the other part was. Oh, is it so? So the 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 reason is this. Um, there's still a market for CBD outside of THC because a number of people are looking for the benefits, but they're not looking to get high, essentially. So you really have different, different purposes. Um, and, there's, so, and also CBD is going to be nationally legal now versus you know, maybe marijuana may or may not be nationally legal at some point. So that does give you more flexibility in your market because you can sell it further. So we really envision several different streams for cannabis. The marijuana and the rec uh, adult use marijuana will be one market, but we think that there's still going to be the CBD market. And for people that are going for CBD, they don't really want to get high. So, so it's really a consumer issue if you have something that has THC in it with somebody who doesn't expect it, right? Because, you know, you, you want to you get high when you want to get high, not you know, when you don't, right? <laughs> right. Um, I, I, that's a, that's a tough one. I mean, you know, because they're, they're regulating the product, you know, you can, you can do whatever you want to produce seed. And, and there's a big discussion about certified seed, which a lot of people, you know, cause we certify seed here, right? That's work that's been going on forever, but we don't certify seed for THC or CBD content. It's certified for other, other purposes. But yeah, I mean, the idea would be to have certified seed and have criteria on the certification process so that you get something that you believe is a true breeding product. But I don't think we're there yet. So maybe at some point, regulations on the seed production can come in. And one of the issues I think with the seed production is that this is a wind pollinated crop. So the more people are starting to grow marijuana, I think there could be more difficulties with producing hemp, honestly. Kim. So it sounds to me like really ultimately this is gonna be a clonal crop. Um, that um, you're gonna want because you need to have so much control over the product. And because as you just said, if you're if you have if you're producing seed and you have wind pollinated crops. Um, you, you have the potential for for contamination of your seed, um, and you know there are plenty of other clonal. I mean, the whole sort of nursery plant industry is all based on producing clones and and then you know growing them up into the plants that people sell. So I think ultimately that's probably where all this is going to go into. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah, clones will give you a more stable genetic basis, but I just don't think they're there yet. I think it's going to take a while to, first of all, develop those mother plants that are consistent, right? And then to move to, to cloning, right? And just to piggyback on Kim's question, so if you organize the seminar for us, I'm sure that Sam has an effect on the level yeah, I mean, we, yeah, so, you know, and you know, we're, we're trying to get information out to growers that they can, that they can use. Yeah. And this is potentially a problem because there's a big investment and you know the growing of it is an is a big investment but also the harvesting of it is another big investment so if you're going to lose a crop you want to lose it bef before you've invested even more time and money into it right so yeah i mean i think it is good information for growers in the production of cbd oil does the plant 
I think it's dried prior to processing for the most part, because most of these growers are, are harvesting and then drying, and then they sell it to a producer because you want to reduce the volume flat out. You know, you don't know, I don't know anybody that takes fresh plant material and sells it. And that's why the tobacco barns become a great place to dry and why cannabis can be uh, something for tobacco farmers to, to switch to. Drying can. Well, I mean, freeze drying is, it doesn't matter because the, 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 psych, the psychoactive component or the active ingredient is the decarboxylated product. So that decarboxylation doesn't matter from a, from a use standpoint. Um, it's, just a, it's just a label claim thing. It came up because medical marijuana has THCA claimed on the label. So we had to be able to look at THCA specifically. I use gas chromatography, which is a hot injection. It does the decarboxylation in situ. So I only get one number out of my test result. If we use liquid chromatography, which is done at room temperature, you can get the THCA separated from the THC, which is what Anuja is working on developing now as our new cannabis chemist. Does that answer that? Okay. Yep. Okay. <laughs> For me, there are two sticking points in, in uh, determining how to pass, how to fail uh, the sample. Of course, we want to pass the sample, but you have to fail. Two things can uh, come to mind is uh, drying time and methods of setting. So, drying time, uh, according to you, you said it's strong, it means it's strong. But what does strong mean? It means not a good that no longer. 10% dry and 20% dry, 40% dry, 90% dry. And that's also 100% right. How do you determine what, what gives you the, the confidence to say, I have, I have tried this sample in terms of numbers, not just uh, describing us as from Right. So, so because we did some method development when we first started to work on this. And that one of the first things that I did was we tried to stick it in the oven for different amounts of time. Now, we don't generally work overnight, say for instance. And the last thing you want to do with when you want to turn around a test result quickly is say, well, I have to dry it in the oven for 10 hours, right? Because then how am I going to do that in a day? So what I did was I put it in the oven at, and we picked 90 degrees because it's slightly below the boiling point of water. Honestly, we didn't really want to boil it, right? So, and I put it in the oven for like, say four or five hours thinking, well, I can do it in a day and four or five hours, but it wasn't dry when it came out of the oven. Um, and I knew that because, you know, you can, you can feel it like it doesn't crumble, right? So what we did was we just started saying, well, I'll just put it in the oven overnight and then I'll see how it, how it dries. One of the issues with that still was that um, there's <laughs> technical, right? There's different ovens we have in the lab. One of the, lab one of the ovens didn't have a vent in the back, so it's not venting the moisture off. And if I put too much plant material, I could dry it overnight and I could come in and it would still be wet on the inside. And I can tell because I weigh it when it goes in and I weigh it when it comes out, right? I know that in that oven, the percent dry remaining after that overnight was about 24%. And if I weighed it the next day and I could feel it not being crumbly, right? Then I could weigh it and I might be like 30 or 35% dry. So then I would put it back in the oven, right? Now, last year, we purchased a lovely new drying oven, right? And it has a hole in the back. So it has what we call mechanical or gravity convection. The moisture vents out the back and it dries things much, much better than the old oven. So even though I'm drying for the exact same amount of time, which is overnight at 90 degrees, now I pull them out. The dry percent remaining after that overnight is almost always like 21, 22% if I put in fresh plant material which gives me some assuredness that that is a, a sufficiently dry plant material because I'm, I'm measuring that remaining. Does that make sense? Yeah, so if you go back to your graph, you have the effect of time. Yes. This was part of our method development work.
uh, I know which one you mean, the THCA and the THC. That one? Yes. And we freeze dried it. Nobody's going to freeze dry if you don't have to, because it just takes a lot of time and it's a lot of effort, right? But we just wanted to see what would happen if you freeze dried it. And this is like, you know, this is just sort of like uh, not something that we extensively studied. It's just something that we did quickly. When you sign reports, right. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I can confidently say it's dry. <laughs> the percent dry weight remaining is in the worksheet. We always record it, but we don't we don't report it. So I know it for every sample. Yeah, we absolutely have a number, but because dry weight isn't defined in the farm bill, it's like you don't need that number. It just gives us some assuredness that we're almost always drying it to the same level, you know, and, and, and Joe asked a question about dry because he said brittle is a subjective property, right? It is subjective, um, but again, there's no definition of how dry is dry enough. And at some point you're losing more than just moisture, you know? I mean, we're not ashing it, right? I mean, you know, if I put it in at 500 degrees for like an hour, then I would ask ash, but that's not the intention, right? So it's, it's a very squishy, it's a very squishy term, no matter how you look at it. And how do you say, I'm gonna remove all the water without removing other things? I mean. This is a very volatile uh, component and the cannabinoids are, are in there at high percent levels. So after some point, I'm starting to lose that too. There's no doubt about it. I mean, the smell certainly changes from when you put it in the oven until when you take it out. And most people think it doesn't improve. <laughs> there's a, yeah, I mean, there's, there's so, right. But we had to, we had to start logging samples out. So we came up with the easiest thing to do, which is to dry it until it's brittle. And actually you can really, you can feel it. Like, you know, when you do it a lot, you can feel it. Like if it doesn't do this and crumble, then we put it back in the oven. Uh, Jaya, I know. I did, when we first started, there was a graph that somebody had produced that had a temperature and a timing of drying. Yes, and we did look at that. That's one of the things we used to sort of like pick 90 degrees and all of that. Yeah, I mean, it's, it has been done. I don't know how rigorously it's been done. You? It's probably more dry than the farmer would sell it at, I would guess. And, and here's, the, here's the funny thing. Like I talked to the guy in Colorado and I was like, well, how do you dry it? And he's like, well, I just stick it on a rack overnight. And he said, it comes back and it's brittle. And I was like, oh, so we stuck it in the hood overnight. And it was like, no, it's not, it's not only not brittle, it's not even dry. And it, and it turns out that Denver has like, you know, 20% humidity in the air. And so they can just literally dry it at room temperature, right? And when you use a tobacco barn, it, it, that flow through the barn is actually pretty critical. And we've done multiple things where we tried to even, I, in fact, we've taken dry plant material, stuck it in a hood and found that it accumulates moisture over overnight. It will weigh more in the morning, not less. You know, Raleigh? So we do analyses on behalf of other state agencies. 
So I can assure you, nobody from the station will be testing or going to your backyard and collecting samples. So, so here's the thing. Um, there, there's, you know, we always have these issues about where we don't do uh, testing for other, for individuals, right? We only do testing on behalf of other state agencies. However, with the, with the hemp, we actually started testing directly for the growers, partially because when, the, when this whole thing started, the Department of Ag said, I don't know that there's laboratories in the state that can do this testing. So we have a requirement, but we may not have anybody to do it. So how are the growers supposed to meet this? So we agreed to do testing directly for the growers. So you know, yesterday a grower from wherever came in and brought us hemp and we are continuing to run those samples. We don't foresee that happening next year because next year with the hemp the samples will all be have to will all have to be collected by a sampling agent those sampling agents will work for the department of ag and they all of the samples will come here whereas last year they could choose us or they could choose a private laboratory as well so moving forward we don't want to accept samples from individuals but we did when it was necessary to make sure that we supported the hemp farmers in Connecticut. Does that make sense? So then the only way that we would get samples for that would be if drug control, who is uh, to my knowledge, enforcing all of the adult use marijuana rules has some reason to collect samples of marijuana off somebody's back deck. And then they, they would bring it here in all probability because we are the analytical services testing agency for um, DCP. Yeah. Okay. I know we, we, I don't know. You have another one, Chris? So, uh, for this one, the third and So, it varies between labs, between 30 and 50 percent. So, and it looks like we are generous enough to give people 50 percent of our units. So, um, how does that, that's, so that's not the standard. But it's not the same. That's great. So if you're not going to because Yeah, it, it, there's la so laboratories like to think that they're better than they are. So some laboratories are using like 15 or 20 percent measurement uncertainty, yes, and they failed crops at 0.45. So yeah, so now now what happens? So what happens is the Department of Agriculture will look at the test report. And we are the referee laboratory for those growers. So what happens is if the, if the Department of Ag says, you know, maybe you should just have this tested again by the department, you know, by analytical chemistry, um, and then some growers will choose that route. So then they bring it here as a compliance sample instead of a surveillance sample. And then we pass it if it meets our criteria and then they're free to harvest. Does that make sense? And we do pass more samples than maybe other laboratories, but I think that given, I, I think other laboratories, they probably use their precision, which is their measure of how tight their test result is when they repeat the experiment, right? Versus their, um, the incorporating the, the field sampling and also whether or not they're getting the accurate result, not just the precise result, so I think that we've just taken a broader view on what measurement uncertainty should include. And it actually, the USDA guidance doesn't say it. It just says the lab determines it, but it doesn't actually say what it should be. So yeah, those samples just come here and we retest them. Okay. Thank you.